RGB and component video are great, but what do you do when you gotta deal with composite and S-video? Let's take a look at two different approaches when it comes to dealing with these two particular signals. So hey, here we are back with another My Life in Gaming mini episode. And uh, this time we're gonna look at something that we don't really talk about all that often, composite and S-video. We had a chance to look at two different devices, the RetroTank 2X Pro, which was provided to us by Mike Chi for the purposes of this video, and the Koryu, which was developed by Mega Ari, and we bought from videogameperfection.com for use in our setups. Right, so the RetroTink is a product that I've kind of been singing the praises of for a year or so, mostly because I, I see it as this like really kind of down to earth, very practical device. It captures the, the commonly available signals uh, that people might have for North American consoles, at least. Composite, S-Video, Component. It's got no added latency and it, it looks good. It's only a 2X scale, so it's not like crazy or anything, but you are starting with a much better baseline for getting your consoles on the TV at a price that I feel like people who want to get something good out of their consoles and they know that just plugging into their TV isn't always the best solution. Uh, I just think it's a fantastically practical device. But in my opinion, the real benefit of the 2X Pro is really just ease of use. So it, it's hard to say whether that's worth the extra jump in cost. It's about 130 US dollars. Uh, and the RetroTink, original RetroTink, they call it the RetroTink 2X Classic, uh, that, that's gotten a price drop to more like about $90. So I do think it's worth pointing out that the RetroTink 2X Classic did have like a few small modifications since the time that we reviewed it. Uh, there was kind of an audio over modulation issue uh, that the newest version has fixed. We're entering Corneria City now. This is horrible. And also uh, added a composite comb filter uh, that is more tuned towards game content as opposed to like just standard video content. There's two buttons on the back of the unit. One switches your input between uh, composite S video and uh, components. And the other one switches the filter, which is there is a uh, like a softening, smoothing filter and a scanline filter, which is, which is new to this version. Uh, and it looks pretty good, but it does darken your display a little bit just because of that's the nature of scan lines. That is a, a cool new feature, probably probably the feature that was most missing from the classic. And the clear case is, is neat because it actually has a colored LED that makes it really easy to tell which input you're using. So composite is yellow, S-video is white, like for Luma, I guess. Uh, and then component is green. And on the side, there's two switches, uh, which are really, <laughs> really difficult to, to reach, I found, unless you have like longer fingernails or you're using like a paper clip or something. Uh, one of them is for the comb filter, and uh, that is more tuned towards older consoles like the NES. The other option's automatic, so I think you can just choose that like if you're feeding it like video content, like from a DVD player or a VCR or something. The other switch is the mode switch, which has 2X and pass-through mode. So either you're doing the typical line doubling or you can choose to just pass through your 480i signal and let your TV handle the deinterlace. Or if your TV handles uh, 240p correctly, then you can just send that through as well. Uh, but I, I've just left it flipped up in retro mode and 2X mode and I really don't have a reason to change it. <laughs> Mike Chi recommends not hooking up more than one input at a time because everything is filtered through the same chip, but you might not realize that you're sending like a composite signal and that can darken the S video signal. I would imagine for the average person who's not crazy like us and trying to make, to see what a whole bunch of different things looks like, it's probably not that, that big of a deal. You just plug in what you need. You play that game or that system, you know, you're probably going to be playing the same game for a week or something, you know. But outside of that, it, it is an easy device to use. And it is nice that it has the full size HDMI. I, I don't prefer many HDMIs, but you know. When you first glance at it, you might say, where is the, the composite input? 
in an effort to streamline the overall look of it, I really like that the that the green input doubles as composite. Like the, like the classic, this device does not support 480p inputs. I understand a lot of people, including myself, would love for this to just pass through for, uh, 480p. So that way, you know, most PS2 games, for example, are 480i, but there are a good number that support 480p. You probably want to use 480p. But if you're hooked up through this, you're going to have to figure out another way to hook up those 480p games. So that's definitely an inconvenience, but it is the most practical video processor for hooking up old systems to modern TVs uh, that I am personally comfortable recommending. <laughs> So on the other side of the spectrum, we have the Koryu, which isn't a scaler of any kind. It's actually just a transcoder that will take a composite or S-video input and transcode it to a component. Which is something that you would think would actually be pretty common, but it's not. I don't know. It just seems like other companies haven't really pursued making that a readily available product, and that has made it difficult to use systems that where their best signal is S-Video, until now there have been very few ways to do that easily. The Corio is meant to be a companion device for the OSSC. You know, you can feed the, the component output from it into the OSSC, and that gives you these two inputs that, you know, a lot of people would feel that the is one of the biggest faults of the OSSC, that, is, that it's lacking a, a, a composite and S-Video input. The Koryu is sold through VideoGamePerfection.com and it retails for about 82 euros, which comes to about 90 US dollars. You can even tell from the shape of it. It can be useful in other situations, but it's definitely no doubt targeted toward OSSC users. So if you put the price of the Koryu on top of the OSSC, you know, you're looking at, some, at a combo price that's almost around $100 more than the retro tank. Uh, but for that $100, you're getting a 3X and a 4X and a 5X scale of this stuff. Which is a lot more than, you know, just the 2X 480p that you get on the retro tank. You know, especially when you're dealing with composite, that, that's very a very noisy signal. Uh, and certain different systems kind of have different characteristics to their composite video. I mean, it varies wildly. Uh, the NES, kind of almost has this crunchy texture that you can really see in the uh, large areas of flat color. And the OSSC will show that pretty clearly. Uh, if you set it to 2X instead, it does kind of blend that, that noise a lot better. But then you compare it to the RetroTINK or the RetroTINK 2X Pro, it just, it handles composite, I guess, much more elegantly. It's really tuned to kind of minimize that noise. Uh, so in some ways, uh, even though it is a softer image, uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of composite, the RetroTINK uh, is probably a little more flattering. The RetroTINK is a lot smoother and, you know, might look better to some people, but composite through the Koryu feeding into a uh, into an OSSC, I just feel like it gives it a much more accurate look to what composite actually looks like on a TV. The Koryu almost gives a more, I guess you could say, realistic <laughs> uh, interpretation of what it, what it looks like, what it is. While there is only uh, composite and S video, there are two different modes per input. Uh, one of them is just a standard input and the other one is a uh, 7.5 IRE. 7.5 IRE is often referred to as pedestal and that'll darken the image a bit. As far as I understand, it's basically a just different standard for how the gamma is set, uh, that certain regions might prefer one or the other. Uh, as far as game content goes, as far as we've seen, it mostly seems to be mastered for the first mode 
that you come to. So when you're when you're cycling through the mode buttons, uh, it'll be the, the first that you come to for each input. So you'll see a red LED when it's on composite and a green one when it's on S video. The first one that you click to when it turns red, that's the one you want for game content. And then you'll hit it twice to get to the first one for S video. Uh, if you have it on the other one, games are definitely going to be too dark. But one of the things I really like about it is it just helps me streamline my entire setup. And I'm basically getting the exact signal as, as composite or as video that it's receiving. And you know, and speaking of composite video, it, it is worth bringing up the Frame Meister, obviously, because the Frame Meister's, one of its many big advantages is that it's got all of the inputs, composite, S-video, YPB, PR via the D-terminal, which can be adapted to component, of course, and RGB, you got all that already in there. The Frame Meister, I wouldn't say does any particular magic with composite, it's, it's, it's very sharp. It's it's comparable to what it looks like through the Core U on the OSSC, I would say. Um, but it's definitely, the, the RetroTig does a good job of cleaning it up. But that said, uh, just, I guess somehow, something about the process of transcoding it, I did notice that certain scan lines uh, that, you know, with composite video, you sometimes sort of see these dotted patterns that just kind of make you know, are just the results of noise. And I did notice that in some cases, some of those parts of the scan line were cleaned up and looked like a more solid color. Uh, you might have to adjust like your, it, this is specifically if you're using a CRT, uh, you might have to adjust the brightness a bit, but it's still composite video. It, it doesn't magically make it look like S video or component, but it, it, it can have a small improvement. I mean, there are different ways uh, for devices to handle composite, and the Core U seems to handle it pretty well. So with this video, uh, comparing kind of the RetroTINK and the Core U, you jump up from composite to S video and you're you're most of the way to RGB, especially if you're looking at a system like a, a standard SNES that has kind of that softer uh, video output. S video is such a comparatively clean signal that it doesn't really hurt to sharpen it up. As long as you have a good S video cable, there's a lot of crappy ones out there. Uh, I was, I had an old S video cable that had composite and S video for, for Nintendo systems and it is, horrible yeah i mean there are a lot of bad s video cables out there especially for nintendo systems and i really don't trust those like multi-console or multi-output cables you know the ones that have composite and s video you know for for systems like the super nintendo the playstation playstation 2 uh you know people may not have you know hd retrovision cables for those for example and S video, uh, it's just a, it's, it's a good option and we haven't used it for ourselves, but I know that retro access is also making a new S video cable, uh, that, you know, that's just great to have a new good option. I mean, based on the quality of the rest of their cables, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's pretty darn good. <laughs> It still is early days with this. For instance, there's a button on it called Option, which doesn't even have a function right now. All you, when you hit it now, it just like makes a screen blurry. The manual that you can download for it even says like, oh, there's a blur filter, but it's not even implemented correctly. So, I mean, they are very openly acknowledging that the device is still in the works. Uh, you know, you can buy it now, and you can use it for its basic functions very well. Uh, it's only been available for gosh, probably like a month and a half or so now, but there is a lot of updates planned for it and they're still working on some, some quirks, some of which we've already found. So the issue that you discovered first uh, and then I kind of confirmed I was having the same problem, 480i on this thing is not great right, right now. It's, it's weird, it's just, I think it's transcoding it incorrectly. Uh, because when it feeds out to a PVM, the, the fields are inverted, everything will have a, a shimmer and it will move. 
incorrectly, and we were I was noticing that with GameCube games at first, and it was only happening on PVMs, but the OSSC was seeing it correctly. So I had you uh, check it out on your PVM 20L5, and you confirmed that you had the same issue. Well, and I saw it on other PVMs and, and even my consumer CRT, uh, and then I was having difficulty getting my if getting my capture card to accept uh, the signal through the OSSC. I couldn't get the Frame Meister to see it at all. You were able to get some situations where you power cycled a few things and it fixed it, but that didn't work for me. Like as far as 480i goes, like I'm pretty stuck. You, if you do buy it now, be aware that you might need a certain kind of device to update it, update the firmware. You need a, what's called a USB ASP programmer. Other devices use a JTAG updater, but this is, this is something I've, I've never really used before. When you're dealing with 480i, in some ways, part of me prefers what the Retro Tinks Bob Deinterlace looks like as opposed to the OSSC, which is very sharp and very crisp. But there's actually there's a smoothing filter. That's what one of the buttons on the top does. Um, that weirdly enough actually looks pretty good for 480i stuff in my opinion, or even just like 3D graphics uh, that are 240p. But especially with 480i, it's sort of softens that flicker of the interlace and makes it feel a little more subtle like a like it would on a, a CRT, for example. That is one area where I feel like the RetroTank may beat the OSSC is just that, that sort of softer look for uh, 480i if you choose to use that filter. One notable difference of the RetroTank 2X Pro is that it is now a full range color space versus the limited of the original. And that might cause issues in people's setups where they might have to change the black level of their TVs. Right, right. Limited range is more commonly used for like consumer TV sets. Uh, but usually these days you can change like the black level setting, like on our TVs, uh, our LG TVs, it calls it black level low and black level high. Uh, so it, it's not a big deal. The OSSC uses full range. So I do like the fact that the 2X Pro uses full range because that way I don't have to change anything on my capture card settings. But I do hope that the RetroTank makes it selectable somehow in the future, like maybe either via like a firmware update or, you know, you can if you can select different firmwares like a full range firmware or a limited range full firmware because my TV has individual settings per resolution and 480p is more of a common resolution. So I'd want the, uh, the black level to match what my other systems use for for the, for the color space currently. While the OSSC uses full range, but it's the only thing that I have that outputs 960p. When my TV detects the 960p signal from the OSSC, so it automatically sets it over to full range and I don't even have to think about it. So I do hope that my Qi makes it so it's perhaps selectable in the future. The, the firmware is easily updatable via USB. Uh, there hasn't been any updates for it yet, but I mean, I'm assuming that when it comes time to update it, you can just plug a USB cable into the micro USB that you use for power and just plug it into a computer and probably just drag your firmware update right onto it. Yeah, but I mean, honestly, there's nothing that I can really think of right now that needs to be updated. I think it's, as far as the way that this hardware is designed, I think it's about as full featured as it can be from my perspective anyway. So I guess it just depends on whether you've already got an OSSC and you kind of want this fully integrated setup through this one device, or if you're just starting from scratch and that's just like too high of a bar for you, then, you know, either the RetroTing 2X Classic or the Pro, you know, those, those will get you started, you know, with that, you know, no added lag HDMI scaling and gives you access to signals from cables that you probably already have for your old systems. Yeah, I mean, it, it is such a good entry point for people that are just looking to get that little hit of nostalgia from their old systems. 
and they first see it on their TV thinking, why does this look so bad? Don't forget that composite is composite. You know, even though these are very well-made devices, they will not make composite look as good as it does on a CRT. Uh, but it will give you a much better starting point than just plugging it directly into your TV for sure, your, your HD TV for sure. Systems like the NES, the best signal it can output is composite video. Systems like the Genesis, a lot of people believe that composite is the correct way to use that system. Uh, N64, 3DO, those are systems where the best signal that they can natively output is S video or the GameCube where, you know, getting a, a cable that does better than S-Video can be expensive, even with like some of the newer options. So those are all situations where you might want to use composite or S-Video to save some money or to not have to modify your consoles. And, and that's why I love these devices so much because they provide that sort of middle of the road stock console experience on an HD TV uh, without having to get involved with, with that whole rabbit hole of, of cables and mods and all that. So it's really kind of a toss up between, you know, are you gonna be using more composite, more S video? Uh, I, I think you could pick either one and be happy. And really, I mean, time is only gonna tell which one we're going to use more of, because I think it's important to represent sort of that more, <laughs> I guess I like to call it down to earth uh, signal. You know, uh, there is sort of a nice nostalgic feel to composite video uh, that I do think is worth representing in our videos. Uh, I think you're going to be seeing that full range of video quality a lot more often in our videos. <laughs>